Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. A few weeks ago, I spent some time on the MIT campus for the MIT Mystery Hunt. And while I was walking down a hall, uh, I saw like labeling that was kind of partially blocked by just the architecture of where I was. So all I could see were the words Ellen and Lobby. And I was like, is that a lobby named for Ellen Swallow Richards? (laughs) Uh, And I just kept walking a little farther to see what it was. It indeed was the Ellen Swallow Richards Lobby. And then my brain, like, started fishing around trying to connect to, like, of all the people that I know from history, (laughs) which one was this one? So Ellen Swallow Richards has come up briefly on our show before. In our 2020 episode on the Bureau of Home Economics, she was a big part of the establishment of home economics as a field. Among other things, she convened a series of conferences known as the Lake Placid Conferences, and that's where the term home economics was chosen to signify this field. Uh, This work is probably what she is best known for today, but it happened actually pretty late in her life and career. And before she even got to that point, she broke a lot of ground and in a lot of ways was just way ahead of her time. Ellen Henrietta Swallow was born on December 3rd, 1842, in Dunstable, Massachusetts, a rural community not far from the border with New Hampshire. Her parents were Peter and Fanny G. Swallow, both of whom had experience as school teachers. And as school teachers, they had strong opinions about how Ellen should be educated. They were worried that the local school would not be rigorous enough for her academically, so for the first years of her life, they taught her at home. When she was little, a doctor told Ellen's parents that she should be encouraged to play outside and to be physically active for the sake of her health. So she spent a lot of time exploring the farms and the woods of the area. An early 20th century biography described her as, quote, perilously close to being a tomboy. She particularly loved learning about and taking care of plants and flowers, and that's something that would bring her a lot of joy for her whole life. She didn't spend all of her time outdoors, though. She also learned to cook and clean and to do all the other domestic tasks that were part of maintaining an efficient and orderly and well-kept home. In 1859, when Ellen was 16, her parents moved to Westford so she could attend Westford Academy. It had been open to students regardless of their sex since its founding in 1792. Ellen excelled as a student, particularly in Latin, which gave her a foundation to also learn German and French. And she also started picking up new skills outside of school. Her father opened a store, and she spent as much time helping with the business as she spent helping at home. She also took on new responsibilities at home as her mother experienced a series of illnesses. So she was really starting to manage their household. This was a lot of work beyond her schoolwork. She was described as always having a book open beside her, whatever she was doing. By this point, she was already forming some strong opinions about things like sanitation and hygiene, and that would go on to be a big focus in her life. For example, the family store sold tobacco. That's something she didn't really like, but it was necessary to keep the business going. It really wasn't unusual for men to come in, buy their tobacco, and then sit around the stove in the store and just talk while smoking their pipes. At one point, Ellen complained about this, and one of the men asked why the store sold tobacco if they didn't want people to use it. She said, well, we sell you molasses too, but we don't expect you to stay here and cook it up. Ellen was at Westford Academy until the spring of 1862. After that, she planned to start teaching. But her plans were temporarily disrupted when she contracted measles. Teaching was never her long-term goal, though. She wanted to go to college. She just didn't have the money to start right away. It's possible that the Civil War was affecting her financial situation. That spanned from 1861 to 1865, but none of the sources that were used in this episode really talk about the war at all, so unclear exactly how those two might have impacted each other. I found the war to be weirdly absent in (laughs) all the accounts. 
Saving up enough money for college took years, and Ellen worked at a a variety of jobs to do it. She was a nurse, a housekeeper, a teacher, and a language tutor. And she also kept on studying on her own, so much so that when she finally had enough money to start at Vassar at the age of 26, her scores on her entrance exams placed her as a third-year student. Once again, she excelled at school. Her best subjects were astronomy with Professor Maria Mitchell and chemistry, which was taught by Charles Farrar. Her biggest complaint was, in her words, quote, they won't let us study enough. They are so afraid we shall break down, and you know the reputation of the college is at stake, for the question is, can girls get a college degree without injuring their health? Ellen Swallow graduated in 1870, and once again, she planned to teach, but this was still meant to be a temporary step. She was hoping that a teaching position might open up opportunities for advanced scientific work, and to that end, she got a contract to go to Argentina, along with a group of other American teachers. President Domingo Sarmiento was campaigning to reform Argentina's education system and to open new schools. So all of these teachers had been hired for that purpose, but he wound up canceling their contracts before they left the United States. Sources agree that this was because of a war, but they don't say which one, and I'm a little fuzzy on the exact timing of when this decision was made. The War of the Triple Alliance ended in 1870, and an uprising that's generally considered to be part of the Argentine Civil Wars started in that same year. After the contract in Argentina fell through, she tried to find an apprenticeship as a chemist. While she loved astronomy, she thought chemistry had more practical day-to-day applications, especially ones that could help make the world better, which was what she really wanted to do with her life. But she wasn't considered suitable as an apprentice because she was a woman. Finally, one of the chemical companies that she had applied to suggested that she might continue her studies at the newly opened Massachusetts Institute of Technology. MIT had started holding classes in a building on Boylston Street in Boston's Back Bay in 1865. Aside from the money that she needed for tuition, though, there was just one problem— The Institute had not admitted any women as students, and it wasn't sure that it wanted to. The Committee of the School of Industrial Science discussed Ellen Swallow's application and ultimately decided to allow her to enroll as a special student, quote, it being understood that her admission did not establish a precedent for the general admission of females. The faculty was also, quote, of the opinion that the admission of women as special students is as yet in the nature of an experiment, that each application should be acted on upon its own merits, and that no general action or change of the former policy of the Institute is at present expedient. As a special student, Ellen didn't have to pay tuition, and at first, she actually thought her designation as a special student was solely about her economic situation. But really, it meant that the university could allow her to attend classes without having to list her on the student roster or otherwise formally acknowledge that a woman was attending the school. Home economist Caroline Louisa Hunt, who published a biography of Ellen Sweller Richards in 1918, summed it up as, quote, So it came about that the answer to her question, are women admitted, was not they are, but you are. Ellen wrote this in a letter to her friend after being accepted. Quote, You will know that one of my delights is to do something that no one else ever did. I have the chance of doing what no woman ever did, to be the first woman to enter the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and so far as I know any scientific school, and to do it by myself alone, unaided, to be welcomed most cordially, is this not honor enough for the first six months of post-collegiate life? She started at MIT in 1871, and we'll talk more about her time there after a quick sponsor break. While she was still a student at Vassar, one of Ellen Swallow's many, many letters back home to her parents talked about how busy she was, how she was just taking on too much in pursuit of training herself for her future. 
She ended this letter with, quote, I would like to enjoy the quiet with you a little while, but my life is to be one of active fighting. She didn't start her time at MIT by fighting, though. While she wasn't totally aware that her special student designation was a way for the university to avoid acknowledging that it had admitted a woman, she did know that there were plenty of people who did not think she should be there. So she tried to make herself as unthreatening as possible and to continually demonstrate that while she was doing something considered to be unwomanly by attending the university, she still had a lot of the traits and skills that were expected of a woman. In a letter dated February 11th, 1871, she wrote, quote, I try to keep all sorts of such things as needles, thread, pens, scissors, etc. round, and they are getting to come to me for everything they want. They leave messages with me and come to expect me to know where everything and everybody is. So you see, I am useful in a decidedly general way, so they can't say study spoils me for anything else. It may feel disheartening to think that she was having to act out feminine stereotypes to smooth her way at the university, but she also saw this as a means to an end. In that same letter, she also said, quote, I hope that I am winning a way which others will keep open. Perhaps the fact that I am not a radical and that I do not scorn womanly duties, but deem it a privilege to clean up and supervise the room and sew things, etc., is winning me stronger allies. She also faced some personal hardship during her first year at MIT. In March of 1871, her father died four days after being struck by a train. She had to travel back and forth between Boston and her family home in Worcester every day to care for her father in the last days of his life, to see to his affairs after his death, and to care for her mother, who was chronically ill. And although there were certainly people who tried to make her feel welcome at MIT, almost none of them were women, which felt lonely. There were literally almost no other women there. She did become friends with Margaret Stenson, who was MIT's first and, at this point, possibly still the only woman employee. Margaret Stenson managed the supplies for the chemistry department. Ellen once again excelled as a student, and in 1873, a committee voted to allow her to present herself as a candidate for a degree and to take the exams required to earn that degree. She graduated in 1873 with a bachelor's degree in chemistry, making her the first woman to graduate from MIT. Based on the content of her thesis, Vassar also awarded her a Master of Arts degree, and she really wanted to go on to pursue a PhD. Various sources suggest that MIT balked at the idea of possibly awarding its first PhD in chemistry to a woman, but she also just didn't have the money to continue to pursue her education. While studying at MIT, Ellen had met Dr. Robert H. Richards, head of the Department of Mining Engineering. Again, in the words of biographer Caroline Louisa Hunt, quote, Miss Swallow and Professor Richards, differing widely in temperament, she being quick to see, to move, and to act, he slow, deliberate, and judicial in his mental attitude, had met upon the common ground of interest in scientific pursuits and had fallen in love with each other. Robert proposed to Ellen in the lab in 1873, but she did not give him an answer. He was not her first suitor, and she had seen a lot of women's lives completely change after getting married, because at that point, they were expected to start focusing exclusively on their homes and families. She wanted to be sure that a marriage to Robert Richards would not put an end to her educational and scientific pursuits. In the interim, she established a private practice in sanitary chemistry, doing things like testing food for adulterants, checking wallpaper and fabric for arsenic, and measuring air and water quality. Although she did this to earn a living, she also worked for free for people and organizations that were struggling. In 1875, Ellen agreed to marry Robert Richards, and they made it pretty clear pretty much immediately that their marriage would not derail her work. Ellen and Robert worked together often throughout their marriage, and their honeymoon was a working trip to Nova Scotia with his mining students. Uh, And then I said some extemporaneous bit after that. Hopefully that will blend in fine. (laughs) 
with the extemporaneous part. I'll do a second take just in case. In 1875, Ellen finally agreed to marry Robert Richards, and they made it clear pretty much immediately that their marriage would not derail her work. Ellen and Robert worked together often throughout their marriage, and their honeymoon was a working trip to Nova Scotia with his mining students. They were touring a bunch of mines and taking samples and pers- like supervising all these college kids. <laughs> Isn't it romantic? Um, Ellen and Robert moved into a home in Jamaica Plain, and until Ellen's schedule got to the point that she needed full-time help around the house, she allowed women students to board with them in exchange for helping with housekeeping. She also wanted their home to be comfortable, sanitary, and welcoming. As we said earlier, she loved plants, and she turned their dining room into a conservatory space that had potted plants on seemingly every surface. She was also focused on cleanliness and air quality, switching from a coal stove to a gas stove and installing skylights, vents, and screened windows for ventilation. People talked about her immense hospitality. Sometimes she would welcome so many guests into their home that she had to give up her own bed, and she would sneak out to stay in a hotel after everyone else had gone to sleep. As a side note, her focus on ventilation was huge. At one point, she wrote, quote, Once breathed air is as much a waste as once used water and should be allowed to escape. Sewers are built for draining away used water. Flues are just as important to serve as sewers for used air. Since Robert was a department head, he earned enough money to support them both. But Ellen had no intention of stopping working. In conjunction with the Women's Education Association of Boston, she launched the MIT Women's Laboratory, a facility specifically for women to study science, which opened in 1876. Many of the students at the Women's Laboratory were teachers who wanted to improve their knowledge of the sciences, although some were studying out of personal interest and others were hoping to pursue a career in science or medicine. Richards was on the faculty, making her MIT's first woman faculty member, although she did not draw a salary and even contributed about $1,000 a year to the lab's operation. Ellen Swallow Richards didn't just want to open up opportunities for women to study science at MIT. She also wanted to make scientific study accessible to women who couldn't go to college. So also in 1876, she started working with the Society to Encourage Studies at Home, eventually becoming head of its science section. She developed science curricula that people could pursue at home by correspondence. This society had been founded in 1873, following the example of Britain's Society for the Encouragement of Home Study. But while the British society was primarily focused on the education of upper-class women, its American counterpart wanted to make education accessible to women of any class. Ultimately, all kinds of people were taking these classes at home. Older people who were looking for something to enrich their time, disabled people, people with chronic illnesses, children whose local schools didn't have the resources to teach particular subjects in detail. Black women and girls who were shut out of whites-only schools and women and girls who faced discrimination at school because of their gender. Also in 1876, Ellen accompanied her husband on a work trip to Germany, and there she learned about naturalist, zoologist, and physician Ernst Haeckel's ideas around ecology, which he spelled O-E-K-O-L-O-G-Y. He described this as the study of organisms in their own environment. After getting back to the United States, Richards built on this to formulate her own ideas of ecology, which she described as, quote, the science of the conditions of the health and well-being of everyday human life. Her ideas on this had connections to later movements for environmental activism and conservation. She thought humans were interacting with rather than acting on the world around us, and her ideas of ecology encompass the home and the built world, not just what we would think of as nature. Although the word ecology still carries this sense today in terms like urban ecology, it pretty quickly became more widely used in a sense that's more about the natural environment than the built environment. 
But for the rest of her career, Richard's ideas on things like sanitation and conservation were more holistic, including not just household cleanliness, but also clean air, clean water, and clean streets and public spaces. As just a glimpse of how she talked about these ideas, here is something she had to say about water. Quote, Water is held to be a gift of nature to man for use by all, and therefore not to be diverted from its natural channels for the pleasure of or profit of anyone to the exclusion of the rest. Neither has one the right to return to the channel water unfit for the use of his neighbor farther down the stream. In 1878 and 1879, Richard studied the quality and purity of food at the request of the Massachusetts Board of Health, which had been founded in 1869. Her results were published in the first annual report of what was then known as the State Board of Health, Lunacy, and Charity, under the title The Adulterations of Some Staple Groceries. Her work suggested that when food was adulterated, the adulteration happened during manufacturing, not at the grocers who sold the product to consumers. She outlined various adulterants that she had found in staples like flour, sugar, and baking powder, as well as her conclusion that supposedly better quality products were often chemically identical to cheaper ones. So people were paying more for something that they thought was more pure, but really wasn't. Richard's later studies of food adulteration would uncover some dramatic examples, like mahogany sawdust used in place of cinnamon. Richard's work in this area is often cited as a reason that Massachusetts passed a Food and Drug Act in 1882, more than 20 years before the federal Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. In 1881, Ellen Swallow Richards, Alice Freeman Palmer, and others came together to establish the Association of Collegiate Alumnae, which later became the American Association of University Women, A year later, with the help of the Women's Education Association, she established the Summer Seaside Laboratory on Cape Ann in Massachusetts, and that was one of the marine research laboratories that eventually became part of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. In 1882, Richards also published her first book, The Chemistry of Cooking and Cleaning, A Manual for Housekeepers, which described cooking, cleaning, and sanitation in terms of applied science. It had four chapters, starch, sugar, and fat as food, nitrogenous food and the chemistry of nutrition, the chemistry of cleaning, and chemicals for household use. She also published a pamphlet called First Lessons in Minerals, which was a guide for teachers that she had developed by working with classes of elementary school children in Boston. Not long after this, the women's lab at MIT closed, which we will get to after another sponsor break. In 1883, MIT started enrolling women as regular students, and the women's laboratory closed. Since women were being enrolled as part of the regular student body, there was no longer a separate laboratory needed. Richards said of this, quote, I feel like a woman whose children are all about to be married and leave her alone so that she is to move into a smaller house in a new neighborhood. You see, it is quite a change for me. And though I knew it was coming, I cannot at once fit all the corners. My work is done and happily done, but the energy will have to be used somehow. And that is the question. That question was because at first, it seemed like the lab's closure meant that Richards wouldn't have a job at MIT anymore. But in April of 1884, a committee voted to appoint her as an assistant under chemistry professor William Ripley Nichols, where she would teach a course in sanitary chemistry at a salary of $600 per year. A month later, the committee revised that amount to $1,000 and once again described MIT's relationship with her as an experiment, which, quote, in no way commits itself to the continuance of this instruction in sanitary chemistry unless encouraged by the results of this year of trial. She also acted as the dean of women, although she was not formally given that title. This experiment was a success. Richards taught at MIT for the rest of her life. She had previously worked as a chemist for the Massachusetts Board of Health, and in 1887, she was asked to undertake a comprehensive study of drinking water quality in Massachusetts. 
This built on work that she had done assisting Professor Nichols at MIT while she was a student, although that had been on a much smaller scale. At the sanitary chemistry lab at MIT, she examined roughly 20,000 water samples from all over the state. One thing she was looking at was chlorine, which was an indicator of both industrial and household water pollution. To that end, she created a normal chlorine map, which showed how much chlorine should be in a water supply based on things like how far it was from the ocean. If a water supply had more chlorine than it should, that suggested the presence of other pollutants. This was the first known study of drinking water quality of this scale, and it is also credited with both water quality laws and the establishment of a municipal sewage treatment plant in Lowell, northwest of Boston. She continued to work for the Board of Health as a water analyst for the next 10 years. Now, we haven't explained specifically what sanitary chemistry means But it includes all of this kind of stuff, like examining air quality and water quality and waste disposal. And it also extends into things like cleanliness and hygiene. It's a pretty broad uh, field that, that touches on all of those things. In 1890, Richards helped establish the New England Kitchen, which we talked about in our previous episode on the Bureau of Home Economics. This kitchen was meant to serve multiple purposes. It would provide inexpensive, nourishing foods to supplement the diets of Boston's poor and working-class residents, and it would also demonstrate cooking and sanitation techniques. One of the tools that it used was the Aladdin oven, invented by Edward Atkinson, which burned kerosene rather than coal and was a lot more efficient. It was estimated that a pound of kerosene burned in an Aladdin oven could replace as much as 70 pounds of coal in a traditional oven. The Aladdin oven was used for slow cooking, so that allowed the staff at the kitchen to slow cook cheap cuts of meat until they were tender and, at least in the minds of the staff, delicious. However... The New England kitchen was also preparing what was described as Yankee cuisine, foods that often had British roots, sometimes influenced by cuisine from indigenous nations living in the northeastern U.S., as in, quote, beef broth, vegetable soup, pea soup, cornmeal mush, boiled hominy, oatmeal mush, pressed beef, beef stew, fish chowder, tomato soup, Indian pudding, rice pudding, and oatmeal cakes. In case you don't know... What's called Indian pudding is a baked dessert made with cornmeal and molasses. But most of the people the kitchen was trying to feed were immigrants from other parts of Europe who just had very different tastes. Many found the menu at the New England kitchen to be unappealing based on what they could make at home. Although the New England kitchen did not become popular as just a go-to source of food for local workers, it did have an impact in other ways. It was eventually taken over by the Women's Educational and Industrial Union, and it was under contract to provide school lunches to the Boston School Committee for years. It also informed the Rumford Kitchen, which was named for Sir Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, which was a display kitchen that was uh, set up at the Massachusetts State Fair and then at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago that both fairs, this kitchen offered food to visitors and also conducted demonstrations of things like cooking and sanitation techniques. Research into nutrition was also conducted at the New England Kitchen, the Rumford Kitchen, and at MIT. This was very early in the establishment of nutrition as a science. The term vitamin had not been coined yet, and although various minerals like iron and potassium had been isolated, vitamins had not. Research into nutrition was critically important. For example, today we know that vitamin C deficiency causes scurvy, vitamin D deficiency causes rickets, and niacin deficiency causes pellagra, all of which can be life-threatening. But at this point, people only knew that these diseases existed, not what was causing them or how to treat or prevent them. But this also paved the way for things like government dietary guidelines, which have a very complicated history. Yeah, it's, I, I feel like that's a whole other digression. <laughs> in 1894, Richards was elected to be an alumna trustee at Vassar, and one of her first tasks as part of that body involved dealing with a sewage crisis at the college. Vassar's sewage system had been put in place in 1865, 
And after converting a lot of solid waste into fertilizer, it then discharged the remaining liquid into nearby creeks. Local residents were tired of the sewer water in their creeks. They were demanding some other solution, and a proposal had been made to build a pipeline to instead carry the waste runoff to the Hudson River. Just dump it in another body of water. It's fine. That was the plan. Richards convinced the trustees to instead implement a plan that involved creating a drain field that would be less expensive and less destructive. In her words, quote, this is a valuable record of the possibility of sewage utilization without offense and of the right principle in taking care of the wastes of an establishment by itself instead of fouling a stream to become a menace to the health of others and an expense to helpless dwellers further down. It is thus in the line of modern economic and sociological investigation, a line which must be followed up if the land is to remain safely habitable. Yeah, she was uh, very frustrated that there was even a plan being discussed to build this pipeline to the Hudson River. She was like, as a university, we should be taking a leadership role in disposing of this waste in like a sanitary, non-polluting way as much as possible. It was also around this same time that two overlapping fields were evolving that would be a big part of Richard's career for the last 15 years of her life. One was home economics. As we set up at the top of the show, Richards convened a conference in Lake Placid, New York in 1899. That is where the name home economics was coined and agreed upon to represent this field. Annual conferences followed, and in 1902, delegates at the conference agreed on this definition, quote, one, home economics in its most comprehensive sense is the study of laws, conditions, principles, and ideals, which are concerned on the one hand with man's immediate physical environment, and on the other hand with his nature as a social being, and is the study specifically of the relation between these two factors. Two, in a narrow sense, the term is given to the study of the empirical sciences with special reference to the practical problems of housework, cooking, etc. As was the case with the term ecology, Richard's ideas about home economics were really broader than this. She had envisioned a field that was focused on applied science in the context of people's everyday lives. She had hoped that the field would encompass things like sanitation, air quality, water quality, conservation, and preserving the natural world through science. This would certainly involve the home, something that she hoped would both make women's lives easier and more efficient and would offer mental stimulation and enrichment through the learning of science. But it wouldn't just be about housework or things that were considered women's work. That brings us to the other field, which was eugenics, which she coined to mean, quote, the science of controllable environment. Eugenics incorporated sanitary science, education, and practical applications of sciences to everyday life, all folded together with progressive social reform. She hoped that eugenics would similarly lead to laws that would prevent disease by preventing contamination to the soil, water, and food, by requiring things like waste removal and ventilation in buildings. And she hoped that this would bring an efficiency to those same goals, conserving resources and preserving the natural environment. One of the reasons that Richards was involved in the home economics movement was that she thought it might help bring eugenics into a wider use. You can see where there's like some overlap in them. Both the home economics movement and eugenics were connected to the idea of racial improvement. This was during the eugenics movement in the United States, which was a movement that was racist, classist, and ableist, but also incredibly widely accepted and normalized. This was rooted in the idea that humanity could improve itself through so-called good breeding, which ultimately involved everything from encouraging the so-called right people to have more children to forcibly sterilizing disabled people, people of color, and others perceived as undesirable. Although this basic concept was applied across races, it was also threaded through with the idea that the white race was superior and needed to be kept pure. So we've talked about this movement a number of times on the show before, including in our episode, The Calicax and the Eugenicists, which we are actually rerunning as an upcoming Saturday classic. 
The eugenics movement in the United States went on to influence the Nazi party's ideas on race science, and that led to hundreds of thousands of forced sterilizations as well as murders. Most of the most horrific outcomes of the eugenics movement took place after Ellen Swallow Richards' death. But its core ideas of better breeding and racial purity were part of her work in both home economics and euthenics. She saw euthenics as a more efficient way to reach the same outcomes as the eugenics movement was proposing. In particular, she thought it would take many generations to improve humanity through better breeding, but that euthenics could have a more immediate impact. Steps like removing pollutants from the soil, water, and air, requiring buildings to be well-ventilated, removing garbage from streets and alleys, and encouraging people to eat nutritious food and keep their homes clean and sanitary would all play a role in improving the human race. And we should also take a moment to note that beyond this connection to, like, racial purity and eugenics, Richard's work was primarily focused on white, middle-class women. Like, that menu at the New England kitchen that we talked about earlier, she really thought that that kind of food was standard and was what immigrant families should be encouraged to eat. Sometimes she could be disparaging in how she talked about sanitation as it applied to immigrants, to poor people, to people of color, It was kind of contradictory sometimes. She would simultaneously recognize that people were living in a society that forced them to live in substandard housing in neighborhoods that didn't have things like running water or proper disposal of garbage. But at almost the exact same time, she would kind of assume that a lack of sanitation in these people's homes was due to their own ignorance. If you just tried harder. (laughs) Right. Ellen Swallow Richards spent the last decade or so of her life traveling extensively, doing research work, lecturing, attending scientific meetings, and connecting with faculty members from other universities and other figures within the home economics movement. She continued to advocate for euthenics and to incorporate it in other areas of her work. For example, it was incorporated into her 1905 book, The Cost of Shelter, which was an exploration of the idea of home, the role that home plays in society, and the cost per person of various types of shelter. She also published Euthenics, the Science of Controllable Environment in 1910. That same year, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from Smith College, She also spoke at MIT's convocation that year, saying in part, quote, the quality of life depends on the ability of society to teach its members how to live in harmony with their environment, defined first as the family, then with the community, then with the world and its resources. In the last few months of her life, Ellen Swallow Richards started to show signs of heart disease, and her friends noticed her struggling to do things that she had been able to do before. She died on March 30th, 1911. Her husband, Robert, later remarried. He died in 1945. Although the field of euthenics did continue after Ellen Sweller Richards' death, it was largely overshadowed by home economics. There were many reasons for this, including the decline of public support for eugenics after the horrors of the Nazi eugenics program, Eugenics and euthenics just sounded so similar that it was really not possible to separate the two of them in people's minds. The home economics field also continued to diverge from the more broad science-based scope that Richards had envisioned for it, and gradually it became mostly focused on homemaking. I think those of us of an age to remember home ec classes in high school remember that it was like a practical class about cooking and cleaning and sewing. Although things like those home economic classes have really declined in recent decades, a lot of the fields that were originally considered to be part of home economics, like food science and textile science and child development, like those individual fields are still thriving. Uh, To some extent, the field of family and consumer sciences is like the successor to home economics as a field. And, of course, a lot of Richard's work on things like ventilation and water pollution are just still incredibly relevant today. Over the course of her career, Ellen Swallow Richards wrote or co-wrote 18 books. In addition to the ones we've already mentioned, some others were The Cost of Living, Industrial Water Analysis, and Conservation by Sanitation. 
MIT established the Ellen Swallow Richards Professorship to recognize distinguished women faculty members in 1973. I love a whole lot of things about her life and career, and I wish there had not been eugenics. Yeah. (laughs) Which is the case with just a lot of 19th and early 20th century people and movements. Um, Yes. I also have some listener mail. Uh, Our listener mail is from Kristen, and Kristen wrote, Dear Holly and Tracy, I recently acquired several boxes of early 20th century sheet music. I happened to be in the middle of going through it right when Irving Berlin came up as your subject. What a fun coincidence. Your discussion of sheet music, both during the episode and in the the behind-the-scenes, mirrored some of my own discoveries of the trends of the time. Brightly colored covers, the love of the, quote, exotic, sexual innuendo, and sometimes racially problematic lyrics are all fairly common. Most have advertisements for music from the publisher on the inside front cover. Some have a full-page sample. I've also found that many have an introduction that's meant to repeat until your performers are ready. The most charming trend that I've run across is the common inclusion of a ukulele part. Maybe that'll be the next instrument I shall learn Of course, the box of sheet music contained uh, an Irving Berlin, which I've pictured below with some other examples from my box of treasures. One more thing, being of that same certain age as you find ladies, I immediately had to pause the episode to watch Fozzie Bear sing Simple Melody with Gene Stapleton. (laughs) A Muppet break is always welcome. If you notice, Fozzie is playing a ukulele. I find all of your episodes enjoyable, but this one felt like a study guide for my latest musical project. Thank you so much for all you do. I've attached my pet pick of Zach, our one-ear-up, one-ear-down German Shepherd Sharpe mix. This is his favorite, yet not-so-convenient spot to sit and people watch. Best wishes, Kristen. Uh, So Zach is sitting on the stairs, kind of looking out through the banister, um, which my my cats also do, except they also stick their heads out of the banister sometimes, <laughs> um, which is occasionally cute and also sometimes alarming because there are spots on the banister that are just, in my opinion, too high up for them to be potentially jumping down off of. Um, also, one of the many things in that episode that wound up being cut out for sake of time was... Uh, that a lot of music out of Ten Pen Alley had a very similar structure. And I don't want to call it a formula because I feel like that has negative connotations, but there was a pattern that was recognizable. Um, and it was an introduction, a short vamp that drew from the melody and the rhythm of the rest of the song, at least two verses, and then a chorus with two different endings, one that was going to be used if you were repeating the, the chorus and another if you were instead looping back to the introduction or the vamp. So... Uh, like that is a, you see that same pattern over and over. Um, also, if I had to speculate, there's probably a lot of ukulele parts because the ukulele is a very inexpensive instrument, um, which made it a lot easier for folks to get their hands on than something that might cost a little bit ma- more money, like a, uh, a violin or a guitar, uh, as examples of things that I feel like are a little more expensive than a ukulele is. So anyway... That's my conjecture. Don't cite that as, like, historical fact. (laughs) Uh, If you'd like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com and also on social media. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you like to get your podcast. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.